I want to welcome everyone on behalf of the Ethics Committee to the inaugural Ethics Education Session. We have a great program. We're going to start with our first tribute to Dr. John Raffensperger that was created by Dr. Marco Roynitsa and Elliot Pennington. Dr. Raffensperger was a master surgeon. He was technically uh, superb. He was fearless. And I always felt that I was admirably trained by a master technician and a master diagnostician. He was and still is an awesome teacher. Uh, you know, Dr. Raffensperger has always had a very innovative mind. You were a pediatric surgery fellow's best ally. John Raffensperger was a pioneer. One is honesty, two, take very good care of your patients, and three, be patient. Raff was a minimalist. I saw him take careful histories, do a great physical exam, and with a KUB, he felt we should be able to figure out almost anything a pediatric surgical patient brought on, and then we could do the rest in surgery. We had to own up to our mistakes. We had to honestly analyze the whys and the wherefores for those mistakes. That honesty was essential, in Raph's opinion, to moving forward in an ethical and honest fashion. The other question was some of the memorable stories regarding Dr. Raph. I, I got a ton of them. But I don't know in this day and age if I can even tell them. When you came for an interview with Dr. Raffensperger, you knew not to wear your loafers because he wouldn't hire you. He figured if you couldn't tie your own shoes, you couldn't operate. Raph exhorted us to focus on the patient. If it weren't to find out whether the patient had passed gas in order to advance the diet when a child was recovering from an operation, you would have no reason to ever be at the bedside. So in the future, you're gonna have a fartometer in the room and you're gonna write in the orders when fartometer reaches 10 decibels, advance the diet, and then you will be able to stay in your on-call room forever. But beyond all that, Dr. Raffensperger was the greatest clinician whom I've ever trained with. He could size up a child by looking at him and make the diagnosis. I think the world of him, he is one of the true icons of American pediatric surgery and one of the great privileges of my career that, that I was able to spend time with him and get to know him. Dr. Raff was a, an amazing mentor. Dr. Raffensperger, I want to thank you so very, very much. I cannot thank him enough for what he did for me, and I cannot thank him enough for what he did for others. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Raffensperger, if you're in the room, could you stand up for us? Stop and sit down. I have to comment on one of these papers about education. How the hell can the internet teach somebody to find point tenderness and to understand the significance of point tenderness? Thank you for that. I knew we were in trouble when he stood up. <laughs> we have a special tribute to Dr. Aviva Katz, who is the heart and soul of the Ethics Committee. Dr. Mindy Statter will present this tribute. Good morning. Wait a minute. How do we advance this? Oh, okay. 
Aviva was a native New Yorker born in Brooklyn. She received her MD from Mount Sinai, started her general surgery training at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, and then completed her training at the University of Buffalo. Aviva and I were fellows at the University of Michigan's C.S. Mott Children's Hospital under the mentorship of Arnold Koren. Aviva and I were the first two female trainees in pediatric surgery at U of M, and our sisterhood began there. While in Ann Arbor, she met the love of her life, Daniel Weiner. Aviva and Daniel were married in 1995. Aviva's first academic and clinical appointments were at Jefferson Medical College and the Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. While in Delaware, she welcomed their four children, Sam, Gabe, and the twins, Hannah and Shoshana. Aviva was subsequently recruited in 2006 to the University of Pittsburgh. While an attending surgeon at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in 2012, she earned a master's in arts degree in bioethics. Aviva defined her academic and research niche in ethics, clinical ethics, ethics education, and research ethics. As an ethicist, she became a leader at the institutional, national, and federal levels. At the University of Pittsburgh, she was the director of the Consortium Ethics Program and core faculty in the Center of Bioethics and Health Law. Aviva was a certified IRB professional and vice chair of the Institutional Review Board. At the national level, she was the past chair of the AP Committee on Bioethics and past chair of the Ethics and Advocacy and Family and Community Relations Committees of this organization. She was appointed to the Health and Human Services Committee on Human Research Protection in 2016. Aviva was posthumously awarded the 2019 American Academy of Pediatrics William G. Bartholomew Award for Ethical Excellence. She was a fierce advocate for children. She executed leadership with grace and thoughtfulness and truly allowed all voices to be heard. She was a loving wife to Daniel and a loving mother to Gabe, Sam, Hannah, and Shosh. Despite the self-doubt that she shared with me at times about being able to do it all, Aviva embodied work-life integration. She was passionate about family, pediatric surgery, ethics, and travel. And she was passionate about figure skating and ice dancing. The Aviva Cats Trophy is awarded by the Pittsburgh Figure Skating Club, and the first recipient was presented the trophy by Aviva's girls, Hannah and Shosh. Aviva was a brilliant ethicist, compassionate and empathic pediatric surgeon, loving wife and mother, and dear friend. She had a quick wit and a sense of humor that I so cherished. She was courageous throughout her illness. Her son Sam had his head shaved to support pediatric cancer research through the St. Baldrick's Foundation. Aviva passed away on January 17, 2018. She lived her life with purpose, which should resonate with all of us as pediatric surgeons. What we do matters to people other than ourselves. There's a fundraising campaign to establish an endowed ethics program at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and tax-deductible donations can be made at, that web, at this web address. Thank you. All right, now on to our program. Our first paper will be presented by Dr. Ryan Antiel from Mayo Clinic with some discussion by Dr. Bill Middlesworth. The topic is Surgery at the End of Life, a National Multicenter Case Series from Children's Hospitals. One possibility is Boston Children's Hospital on Longwood Ooh, Avenue. Goodness. Is that the one you're looking for? <laughs> <laughs> Not today, thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Could somebody put Dr. Antiel's talk up on the... There you go. That's the last slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we start it from the beginning? Slide one, please. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for this opportunity uh, to present. Pediatric bioethics is often focused on ethics at the beginning of life, not the end. Yet unfortunately, tragically for many children, the beginning and end of life are often too close. So what role do we pediatric surgeons have in the end of life care? 
couple points I want you to take away from this is one, you cannot die at a children's hospital without undergoing surgery. And second, pediatric surgeons play a pivotal role in pediatric palliative care. The data I want to show you comes from over 1.6 million hospital admissions over about a year and a half range from 47 different U.S. hospitals, all part of the FIS database, the Pediatric Health Information System. Using ICD-9 codes, we were able to identify the volume and variation of surgical procedures that children had in their terminal hospitalization. In addition to describing the volume and variation, um, we applied an interesting um, application where we analyzed the um, alleged purpose of the surgery, the typology, if you will. Uh, we had seven categories, including hardware, rescue, exploratory, biopsy, congenital cardiac, congenital non-cardiac, and resection. Of these 1.6 hospitalizations, there were just over 12,000 terminal admissions during this time uh, span. Of these, 93% of these admissions, the children underwent a surgical procedure during that final hospitalization. Interestingly, the age was very early, 0.3 years, with the intercortel range going from birth up to 6.7 years. The average length of stay was seven days, with the range of two to 26 days. And the median cost per hospitalization was around $51,000, again with a wide variation in the range from 17 to 186, looking at the interquartile range. Not unlike pediatric surgery generally, we do a few procedures a lot, and we do a lot of procedures very few times, and that certainly applies in end-of-life settings. The most common procedures on the left of the graph were perhaps not surprisingly ECMO cannulization, chest tube placement, lung incisions, gastrostomy tube placement, and finally tracheostomy. When we looked at the various uh, surgeries done per system, um, the GI tract, our specialty, as well as thoracic, represented almost 50% of the procedures, followed by our colleagues in cardiovascular surgery, um, and vascular. Finally, when we looked at the seven typologies, the most common um, reason for undergoing surgery, one was for hardware. Almost 25% had some sort of installation um, of a device, VP shunt, um, pacemaker, um, portacath. Um, just over 12% uh, of the procedures were undertaken with appeared to be a rescue operation from an immediately life-threatening condition. Um, over 12% uh, were performed for an exploration to try to diagnose and potentially address a problem. And finally, uh, again, just over 12% of these procedures happened to obtain a specimen for um, diagnostic purposes or biopsy. So I have uh, multiple discussion slides, but at this time, um, we're going to pull up um, some prepared uh, questions which might guide our discussion of this data. Whoops. Back we, one slide. If we could pull up that last slide again, please. Thank you. Thank you, so, um, and thanks, Ryan, for a uh, thought-provoking presentation. Um, some discussion points for the audience, and uh, then we'll take, take questions for Dr. Antiel. Um, his data showed that there's extensive surgical involvement at the end of life, and that provokes the questions of whether or not, as pediatric surgeons, we're prepared uh, to manage the issues that occur in that context, and is this a source of moral distress for providers, and if, if so, if we have proper training uh, to manage that. Additionally, um, do these data indicate that significant resources are directed to futile interventions? Um, further, what role the surgeon has in clarifying these goals of care that often happen in a very time-pressured and clinically urgent context, um, perhaps uh, in even a context of resuscitation? And then lastly, how we minimize uh, risk and harm, uh, even in the context of what could be very uh, low probability of success interventions uh, where the prognosis is very guarded. Um, I'd like to open up the, the, to the audience for any questions or discussion points, please. Uh, 
Hi, very nice presentation. Uh, I'm Tim Lotz from Lurie Children's in Chicago. We presented some similar data on this in a smaller subset of patients who had a malignancy diagnosis and found comparable results. Um, that was at the meeting here last year. One of the things that we struggled with was how do you distinguish between patients who came in with terminal diagnoses and underwent procedures versus patients who came in for an operation where you wouldn't expect them to have a mortality who died from an operative related um, complication. So did you make any attempt to distinguish that by looking at admission type, whether they came through the ER, what day of the hospitalization the procedure was performed on, anything like that? Um, no, we didn't look at um, underlying diagnosis or um, route of admission. It was simply um, which hospitalizations ended um, in a death. Obviously, uh, there's a variety. Um, we can imply some of them. Obviously, uh, most easy are, for example, the congenital heart and um, GI anomalies uh, that were performed. Um, but there were routine uh, common procedures as well, appendectomies, for example. And so it's obviously not clear um, in what, what was the context of which that surgery took place in. Okay. One of the limitations of these large uh, databases. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Hunter, Larry Children's Hospital of Chicago. Um, just a very, very thought-provoking presentation. Um, thank you for that. I just wanted to get your um, insights onto um, this, the surgeon's role in determining futility, um, determining whether or not um, we should go ahead and offer these uh, procedures at the, the terminal aspect, and whether or not you think that our surgical trainees receive adequate support in um, and, and um, teaching and, and how to kind of have these conversations so that we can carry them forward into practice. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, there's efforts uh, going forward, certainly at the level of the American College of Surgeons, to provide resources for trainees as well as uh, staff surgeons uh, in terms of uh, education. Uh, the American College of Surgeons now even um, recognizes um, fellowship training in surgical um, palliative care. Um, I think in the pediatric realm, we're a little bit behind that, so there's um, great opportunities to advance in that. It's very difficult to have a conversation about end-of-life surgery without, um, as I say, talking about the F word, futility. Um, certainly the discussion amongst our adult colleagues um, who deal with the enormous amount of surgical um, interventions at the end of life for uh, adult population always kind of goes back to cost containment and the appropriateness of said procedures. We're limited, obviously, in this sort of project to comment on the appropriateness, but certainly that's a huge challenge, especially when facing um, parents of, a, be it a neonate or a teenager who's at the end of life, and that pressure to, can you please just try something, do anything. Um, obviously, um, we need to be better trained and look at outcomes to find ways that our procedures can alleviate, palliate, um, various conditions without um, giving false hope and being willing to say no when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Another. Oh, one more. Another. Another. Sure oh, question. Okay. Sure. Uh, it's an enormous database for, for which you have to work for with. Uh, one of the questions that I'm sure comes out of this is uh, the awareness of the risks uh, the family uh, take when they sign consent for these, uh, if you will, futile operations. And I wonder whether uh, your database gives you enough information to know about that. But certainly, whether it does or not, I think the message out there is the importance of the recognition of futility before that procedure is done. Right. I mean, there's no way to tell um, you know, anything about the consent process. Obviously, uh, parents don't understand risks and benefits. Um, they're not able to. Um, they haven't completed surgical training. They don't understand the nuances. Um, so it's our job to help guide, to provide that information um, in helping working with our colleagues in palliative care um, to make proper recommendations um, within scope that we feel is appropriate. Um, and also having those hard discussions when we feel that a operation is outside of that realm of appropriateness and we're simply prolonging suffering in that case. Difficult discussions, certainly. Sure. Not sure. Ryan, Ryan, I know you're a, a 
surgical trainee and perhaps one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you was about use of language in the ethics world as you probably know there's there are differing opinions on whether to truly use the word futile futility is a difficult concept because in essence it doesn't really exist there's always something you could do and when you use those kinds of terms with families or even in multidisciplinary groups some of our critical care colleagues or other people that that can be um, challenging to bring people to the same page and using words like goals of care and um, talking about doing things for the patient rather than taking away sometimes is a, is a more useful approach. What, what is your perspective in surgical training about how you um, have that kind of language at your, at your disposal? Sure. Um, certainly this is part of the hidden curriculum, right? There's not a lot of formal training that goes on um, in this regard. And so we see examples uh, by mentors who do it well and who do it not. Um, as pointed out, there's terms such as futility, which aren't helpful in these discussions for families, even for us, what does it mean? Um, but rather one's willingness to engage in conversations about what are your goals for care for your child? How can we help them? And which, which of those goals might surgery be able to further? And which goals can we help you with that surgery is not an appropriate way to achieve that? Um, so I think framing and communication are key um, and more efforts to train individuals like myself, uh, general surgery residents, and pediatric surgery fellows will be important because um, the numbers speak for themselves. This is something we will face and face frequently. Um, so developing that sort of competency will be important just as developing competency in critical care, nutrition, these other aspects of what we do. Thank you so much for a very uh, thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Hey. Our next uh, paper is going to be presented by Dr. Kathleen Van Leeuwen. It is uh, regarding the timing of surgery for patients with disorders and or differences of sex development. Uh, and this is a preliminary analysis of stakeholder views on successful outcomes. Thank you. And Thank you very much. Phoenix Children's Hospital. So thanks so much to the Ethics Committee for choosing this as a topic. It's definitely something that my partners have heard so much about in Phoenix. Uh, it's all we ever do is talk about girls with penises and what we're gonna do with them as they get older. So one of the reasons I got into this field, I finished my training in Michigan in 2005, and Dr. Teitelbaum said to me, Kathy, you could really make a name for yourself in ambiguous genitalia. And I thought, that is not what I thought was gonna happen with my career, but that is in fact, I think, what has happened with my career. Hopefully that is one of some things, so. Um, so I have no financial disclosures. I am a member of the North American Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, as well as an affiliate member of Society of Pediatric Urology. So I try to go to all the meetings and get a sense of what we're all doing or what we're all doing differently. Uh, this is a graph that Mary Fallett and I put together for a chapter not too long ago looking at the new categories of DSD. So if you look at what is a disorder of sex development or a difference of sex development, that comes from the Lawson Wilkins Society, Pediatric Endocrine Society, just trying to come up with categories of how to talk about patients. So we don't say hermaphrodite anymore. We didn't say intersex, but I can tell you that is absolutely coming back. So DSDs are congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You guys are used to XX females, so that would be called a 46XX DSD. There's 46XY DSD, which is androgen insensitivity. There's several different kinds. Uh, mixed gonadal dysgenesis is exactly what it is. It's a mixed bag, a whole variety and spectrum of anatomy. Um, and those kids have genital or gonadal ambiguities. And then there's the anatomical issues. So if you look at cloacas, you could argue that's a difference of sex development. There's no question the cloacas have some very interesting anatomy and will have multiple procedures on their perineum over time. The teenagers come to us with MRKH or vaginal agenesis, and we're taking care of those kids in Phoenix. So I would argue that pediatric surgeons, since we have abilities to take care of all of these things and they're all overlapping, we have a lot, of, a lot that we can bring to these patients. Um, there's been a rapid change in public perception of kids with um, intersex traits. And that's how it's being said, individuals with intersex traits, not intersex kids. Although there's now a push to call, instead of a baby with ambiguous genitalia, call that baby an intersex baby. 
So you don't have a male or female. This is not a girl or boy. This is an intersex baby. And those babies are now being raised without surgery a lot, in a lot of cases. There are, um, a lot, there's a lot of interesting press. Uh, CNN is chronicling a child who's six, seven years old. Now her name is Rosie. She's being raised without surgery. Um, she's an advocate for no intervention. And unfortunately, I think her parents are kind of alienating the medical community as a result. She was recently um, in front of the SPU just a couple weeks ago in Chicago and with a bullhorn and saying that she was made the way God made her and nobody should be touching her. Of course, at some point her parents might want something done and they've said they do, but at, I'm not sure who they're going to come to. So the Human Rights Watch group, which is a group that is pretty biased towards no early intervention, produced a video called I Want to Be Like Nature Made Me. This is a really interesting video. We have all of our families watch it because if you have CAH and you're seeking out some procedures, I need you to know that this is, that no surgery is an option and that this is a very controversial issue. Um, the Human Rights Watch equates surgery that we do on children of this sort to genital mutilation and torture. And they're asking groups like us to come up with a response to that accusation. So this has also been a big issue. Katie Couric had a big um, documentary on the gender revolution. When you look at kids who do not have anatomical issues, those kids these days are very interesting. My daughter took her girlfriend to prom, and I had a beautiful suit tailored for her to take her girlfriend to prom. So I've learned a lot about some gender fluidity in my own home. And I think if we all can kind of understand that it's not boy, girl, or intersex, it's, a, it's whatever kids are going to want to be, and we need to get behind that. So we don't necessarily want to make a vagina for a girl who's not going to use it. And there may be a number of reasons why that girl may not use it. So it's been interesting to me to sort out how are we going to take care of teenagers instead. So I don't like to get involved in the protests. I think that in general we've been kind of under the radar as a society, which is great. I think that's a great position for us to be in. There have been combined responses from all the societies, uh, really trying to prevent any legislation from banning surgery, which I totally agree with that. So we don't want to ban families from seeking surgery if they have an informed consent process. But we've worked very hard on the informed con consent process. And so for what we tried to do with this study and what we've been doing, this is part of an R01 at three centers, Cincinnati, Michigan, and Phoenix, is to look at trade-off analysis and how does an individual family for an individual child figure out what's right for them. That involves many things, body image, preservation of fertility, sexual function, autonomy. And so we interviewed patients, parents, and healthcare providers. The healthcare providers are sometimes non-provider non professionals like lawyers, healthcare administrators, and really looked, on, asked some general questions about outcomes. What is a successful outcome? Then we coded those recordings, and then we searched using keywords to see how often do these types of things come up. So for parents, they're clearly conflicted in the newborn period on what to do. They really worry that, er that early surgery could help their child, but that, fear, that they fear that the child will resent them later for making those decisions. For the patients themselves, it turns out that they're pretty comfortable with their parents making decisions for them especially because in our cohort that we're interviewing, they know their parents were very thoughtful about it, so they don't have regrets. But they do, if you ask them, should, it, should the decision lie with you? Should we have waited? They do think that's ideal. But again, they're not as upset as their parents think they're going to be. And then for the providers and the health professionals, we're all coming around to this idea that thoroughly com informed consent is really pretty much the way to go with these kids. Um, we want to be able to give them autonomy, and in, we want to defer surgery in the absence of medical need or medical necessity. But remember, if you defer surgery in a child with a urogenital sinus, you'll have to train that baby girl how to potty train with a penis. And so we have, we've learned how to do this. There are, there are books that we can show them, there are resources, but it's a brand new world. So in conclusion, if, it's a lot of information, I understand, but uh, there's a wide range of diagnoses for these patients. Some of them need to undergo reconstruction in the newborn period. Many of them will undergo reconstruction in the teenage years. And they want autonomy. The parents express conflict. The providers understand the importance of an informed consent process. That process is lengthy. That takes several years. Our ongoing research is looking how to provide tools to help these families with the trade-off along the way, the trade-off analysis along the way. 
One of the big things we do in Phoenix, we have multiple parties throughout the year where we get all the families together. I think what's going to happen is the teenagers are going to teach the younger kids what they want, and then they're going to come to me, and I'm going to provide it. Thank you so much for um, the collaboration of the different teams in Cincinnati and Michigan. Thanks to my wonderful partners um, in Phoenix for allowing me to talk to them about this all the time. And thanks to Dr. Corin, Dr. Herschel, and Dr. Teitelbaum for letting me embark on this part of my career. Thank you so much. I apologize for the technical interruptions. But Aaron. Oh, yeah, thanks so much. Kathy, would you mind hit, seeing if the, yeah, we have one more slide that was the mm -hmm. discussion slide on that same presentation. Thanks so much. I just wanted to say I really respect your approach and I, I, I love the, the, the real honesty with which you approach this and the example of the patient family parties that you're having. You're, you're really the perfect person, I think, to bridge that gap between or, or sort of where this advocacy is between the medical world and the, the patients and families, which, which is, is, is adversarial for sure right now. Um, and I put up a couple of discussion points. We'll see what, what kind of time we have. Um, one of these that I'm interested in in particular is how do you help parents make the decisions um, in terms of the language that you use for informed consent. We think about that um, always in a, in a parent decision-making situation. It's a surrogate decision that the parent is making on behalf of the child. Do you tend to frame that more as what is in the best interest of this child or as avoiding harm? And certainly I welcome others' thoughts on that as well. So we don't usually get a lot of um, people claiming that we're going to uh, cause any harm. I think that's in the, in the public realm, it seems like that. But in the actual office or in these parties, they know us really well and they know there's no way we would harm them. So they trust us a lot. I would say that um, the, the way we use our language is to tell them lots and lots of stories. So I've been doing this now for 15 years. I think it took that long so I knew enough patients because this is rare, right? So you don't really get a chance to know how people are, who they end up dating, or how it all works out. So we tell a lot of stories about other patients and that helps them make decisions about if they want to wait or not. I will tell you, I do also run the prenatal program in Phoenix and the prenatal DSD patients now come to me already telling me that they're not going to do surgery. So it's enough in the public realm that they, they know they don't want to intervene. They tell me, just so you know, I'm going to let my child decide what they want when they want it. So this may just not even be an issue. It, it may be that they're going to tell us that already. Okay. I think we'll take a question from the audience. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you. Oscar Gomez from Spain. Thanks a lot for your interesting talk. And uh, I'm just curious, how do you uh, handle patients, for instance, with a urogenital sinus when you do not perform initial surgery? How do you handle when they start school age, for instance? Right, so it's really interesting. So one thing you can do in school age, um, our parents have taught us that one thing to do is do some role playing with the child. So if they're going to get uh, bullied at school or if you're worried about that, you teach them before they ever get into school on responses. And as soon as a kid gets a response, they usually leave that kid alone. So while they're teaching them how to read at night, you're sitting reading books with your kid, the next thing you do is say, if anybody ever comes up to you and say, hey, I heard you have a penis, let's come up with something really cool to say. And, that's, and they just kind of teach them those responses. So that's been working. Potty training is interesting. Uh, but the kids are doing well. Now, when they go through menses, and we've had patients in Phoenix who never had surgery before, so I met them when they were 12, 14. Uh, when they have their menses, you can suppress their menses, so you could just shut it down. What they'll tell me is that they just pee blood once a month, so it still comes out. Um, sometimes they are pretty obstructed, but a lot of times they're not. So you either suppress them or just let them have their menses until they can understand when it's time to do surgery. When it's time to do surgery, we're going to do uh, whatever with their clitoris that they want and then something else with the urogenital sinus. So we could do a clitoral recession. We could do more than that, although I feel like they need to be older before we start doing reductions and glands reductions and things like that. But we do a urogenital mobilization or if we're opening up a urogenital sinus, we can lay buckle in there as well in, so that we don't get a stenosis. We do a lot of revision surgeries on previous CAH surgeries using buccal mucosa. So by that time, they know us so well that they can use all the words that I just used. So they understand the name of the surgery, what the recovery is going to be, and, and what to do. Thank you. Thanks. Have, I have one more question, if that's okay. Um, and that is, 
What, um, what might you do? It sounds like a lot of the prenatal families are coming and they maybe culturally are just more aware and they don't feel the need to label this child of male or female. But what would you do if you were in a situation or how would you advise a colleague who might be in a situation where a family comes and they really want to make a definitive decision? And how do you counsel that family? So that's their right to do that. And there's each culture is different as well. So we learned a lot in Phoenix from Hispanic cultures and Native American cultures. And across the world, this isn't necessarily, you can live in a nice suburban area and, and raise your child a certain way, or you can live in a, in a situation or a culture where you, it would be better to be binary. And I think we need to be respectful of that. And as long as they understand the risks and are in a loving family that raises the child you know, accordingly, they could even do early surgery in any of those countries and choose a gender. I think it's okay. They just do need to know all of the controversies so that it can be informed. Yes, I think we have another question. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Keith Webb. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. Thank you for the presentation and tackling a um, topic that is a bit timely, but also rare for us to experience. I think I have kind of a twofold question. One is you mentioned the parties and <clears throat> that as a resource for helping patients, parents, and those loved ones that they have through that. Um, could you speak a little more to the resources that you have available? Because I, I feel the sense that I have from the little bit of experience is that there, this is much broader than the patient and the families need a lot of guidance in, in kind of helping care for that too. I wish they were all really well-adjusted families that were approached it maturely and sometimes that's a challenge. And the second question is, the second bullet point um, that kind of concerns me um, at times when I see some of these kids in the age of assent and independent informed consent and when, at, w at what point do you determine, I mean, if you could give me just like a, uh, you know, sure. a, a one minute answer to that entire <laughs> topic, it would be yeah. really great. As far as the parties, it's, really um, the, it's pretty cheap. We just use one of our big conference <clears throat> rooms. We get a bunch of um, Chick-fil-A and pizza we have tons of toys for like the little kids and then the teenagers all kind of get together. Uh, we give service hours to our like kids, uh, high school kids to come and babysit. We have a dad table now, which is huge. So um, the dads who are really good and they have a lot of coping skills, we sit them down and then the other families as they come in, we separate the dads from the moms, put the dads at the dad table. So I think that works really well. We change it every time based on what we're hearing. We do some surveys and they tell us what they need and then we just change it every time. We, we have uh, Spanish speakers and we do um, translation at those as well. So we, we've learned a lot on how to do it and I can tell you more, but I also started a foundation at the hospital with my own bonus money to like pay for this. Um, so, but eventually maybe it'll be in the budget. Um, and then the second question, age of assent. American Academy of Pediatrics says age 14 is when the pediatrician can kick you out of the room and talk to your child. We never do that as ped surgeons. We talk to them the whole time. So I think the age of ascent for these kids is gonna get younger and younger because I'm raising them. So by the time they're eight, nine, they may be ready for reconstructions. We have a readiness just as a group, as a multidisciplinary group, we kind of understand when they're ready. It's not based on the transgender readiness guidelines. So uh, again, we have some checklists that they have to go through to show us that they know what they're getting into. When they pass those checklists, which are physical papers, um, we, do, we offer surgery. Thank you. Thank you so much. so much. Thanks. And our final presentation uh, will be the ethical aspects of organ procurement from children born with anencephaly. And the abstract was submitted by Dr. Oliver Munsterer, but will be presented by Julia Mildenberger, who's a senior medical student from the Faculty of Medicine in Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present a case on the ethical aspects of organ procurement and anencephalic newborns. Anencephaly is a relatively common condition affecting one out of a thousand pregnancies. Also, exceptionally rare cases have lived up to three years. The most affected babies die after a few days. While the brainstem is generally intact, anencephalics have, per definition, no cerebral cortex or conscience. One of the main issues is that a standard brain death criteria cannot be applied to anencephalics. In 1961, the first kidney, and in 1987, the first heart from an anencephalics was transplanted. 
Also, over 100 successful transplantations were, supported, were reported. There is still no relatable data about the success rate of DCD in anencephalics. However, in the last 50 years, only 70 articles about that topic were published on Medline. Since 30 years, the interest has ebbed off. In our interdisciplinary prenatal care clinic, we saw a young couple pregnant with a fetus with anencephaly who expressed interest in donating the baby's organs postnatally. This led to a heated discussion among all disciplines. In this situation, it appears that different ethical concepts clash. In utilitarianism, one would argue that allowing organ procurement from anencephalics would provide the greatest good to the greatest number of individuals. From a deontological aspect, explanting a, a still beating heart from an anencephalics would imply to actively end that individual's life. This leads us to the basic questions whether anencephalics should be considered as persons and how do we define a human. But in, according to the Cartesian dualism, anencephalics should be not considered as human beings. But in fact, what, what makes us human? A certain chromosomal endowment, the potential to develop a conscience, or a beating heart? Interestingly, the most vocal supporters of organ procurement and anencephalics are still the parents. Through new techniques in medicine, there are maybe some new solutions to make organ donation and anencephalics possible. Perhaps better monitoring can define a point where the heart stops beating, but the organs are still harvestable. Perhaps ECMO continuity can be placed preemptively, or alternatively, we can define specific criteria for organ procurement and anencephalics by law. One of the main criticisms is the slippery slope argument. If you're allowing organ procurement from anencephalics, what is about the other brain malformations or sort of brain injuries with brainstem function or other newborns with other lethal conditions? Back to our case. Unfortunately, we couldn't reach a consensus, so the parents decided to terminate the pregnancy. In conclusion, organ donation from anencephalics has the potential to ease the pediatric organ shortage. However, multiple aspects need to be considered. Parents are still the prime protagonists in organ donation from anencephalics. A revival of this discussion with the inclusion of new innovative ideas may revive the possibility to perform organ procurement from anencephalics or newborns with other lethal condition in future. Thank you. So unfortunately, we are not going to be able to take any questions because of time constraints. But I want to thank you so much for a very thoughtful presentation. Excellent. And maybe we can gather on the outside and have more discussion. Thanks all for your attendance. Thank you.